I think so. Yes. Okay, we're good. Yeah. Okay. So once we see ourselves here, I think we are good to go. Okay. Okay. So we just seen one screen, but I think that's fine, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, next talk in the C uh, serious seminar series for 2017 spring semester. So today we have a, a very distinguished uh, speaker. She, uh, her name is Limin Jia. So she's an assistant uh, research professor in Carnegie Mellon University, CMU in Pittsburgh. And uh, she has done lots of work and works on very different aspects regarding formal methods and security. Uh, and uh, today she is going to talk about some of her uh, work on mending the gap between the theoretical and system security research. It will be a generic talk, but I think she'll go into the detail for some of those topics. So, please. All right. Oh, so I have my mic yeah. on. All right. All right. Nice. Thanks for coming. Uh, nice to be here giving the talk. Uh, so I'll start by saying, uh, quoting Yogi Berra, which is a MLB player. Uh, so he says, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. Right. Um, so I want to map this onto software security. Uh, so I have this x and y axis. In x axis is about uh, the formal guarantees. Um, the, mo the more to the left, uh, the more uh, the weaker the guarantee. The more to the right, the stronger the guarantee. And then on y axis we have features, right? A more uh, the closer to zero, you have fewer features. Uh, up on top, you have uh, more features. Um, interesting. All right. So if for the working system, the working systems actually live up here. Um, you have a lot of features, but you tend to have fairly weak guarantees. Right? You want to build a system that actually works. Uh, and then, in terms of models, abstract models, the abstract models, uh, you tend to have a lot of uh, formal properties because you can actually analyze them a lot, uh, but they tend to have fewer features because it's easy for you to analyze them. So of course, ideally, what we want to be is up here in this small bubble where we want to have fully verified system. Right? We want to have a system that actually works, have all the functionality you want, have all the features you want, uh, but also have really strong uh, guarantees that you care about. So in terms of research, uh, a lot of the systems research tend to be in this bubble, right? If they build real working systems, have lots of features. Uh, but maybe uh, in terms of the security guarantee or any of the formal properties, maybe people care slightly less about. Uh, so in terms of theory research, we, uh, we tend to stay closer to this bubble. Uh, we tend to build models, abstractions, prove properties about it. Uh, but because the difficulty of doing proofs and building models, we tend to throw away a lot of features. We claim they're not essential, therefore, uh, we're going to abstract them away, right? So that's, that's where we are. Uh, so we do have uh, a very selected group of researchers actually are doing research uh, over here, uh, especially recently, NSF find a, a big project called Deep Spec. So we have um, Princeton, Yale, um, UPenn, mm -hmm. maybe some other university here, where they what they really want to do is they want to, pr to produce a tool chain where you can write program in C, but at the, end, at the end of the day, I can show you that the machine code generated uh, through a, a verified compiler that the property you have um, actually apply on the machine code, right? You can imagine here, only selected systems can be done this way. Uh, if I'm talking about a hypervisor or a kernel, that can be done because uh, they require a couple thousand lines of code to actually uh, go through. However, if, if I'm talking about browsers, this is going to be really difficult, right? The browser have a lot of really complex functionality. It's going to be extremely hard for me to say I can uh, generate a fully verified browser, right? So, so, so we do have uh, projects here, um, but it's, it's very um, selected project that tend to uh, cover uh, uh, important but small software. Uh, so. Sadly, this is where the real software companies are going. They're adding more and more features, uh, but they're actually introducing more and more bugs, right? So sadly, the most common bug we see these days are still buffer overrun, all the really uh, simple bugs, but they're not disappearing. They're actually uh, appearing more and more often. Um, so, so, so in this landscape, for me, for my research, um, I, I'm somewhere in this blue dot. Uh, so uh, what I want to do is I actually want to analyze the property of systems. Uh, I want to be able to construct uh, provably secure systems. Um, so what I'm doing, or, or the theme of my research tend to be, I actually want to start from a real system, a real browser, a real Android uh, operating system, uh, or uh, I'll talk a little bit about this if this and that framework. Uh, we look at the real system, then we want to figure out what are the nice properties we want to have about the system um, uh, to, to, use, to, to use formal modeling and uh, formal techniques to actually, at the end of the day, uh, show that these are the properties we want and show that uh, the design, uh, at least design level, we have uh, these properties. Uh, the problem with doing this kind of research or the challenges are that uh, often uh, it's really hard to balance um, 
uh, the trade-off between having functionality versus having stronger secure guarantees, right? If I just throw all the features, uh, then I can build a system that's not very useful, but I can show it's fairly secure. Uh, but if I want to have all the interesting features, uh, that often uh, increased my difficulty of constructing a security proof about that system. All right, so, so in terms of the projects I'm working on, so I can sort of draw an axis of theory and practice. Uh, so roughly, uh, I have a few blocks of work. So one main block of work is about information flow security. Uh, so in this talk, I'm just gonna talk about um, information flow on Chromium. Uh, I will, if I have time, I'll talk about uh, using information flow to actually analyze the security and privacy of if this and that framework. Uh, so uh, in this space, a uh, more theoretical topic uh, is something about compositional um, uh, information flow security. Uh, we have upcoming paper about compositional time, timing sensitive non-interference. Uh, so there, there are lots of work in this space. Uh, and then the more practical ones is uh, we actually have infrastructure that will actually uh, taint pages. Uh, the, then using that taint, uh, we're actually thinking about how do I use it in infrastructure to profile web pages, to figure out what the web page is trying to do. Uh, so another uh, block of work is uh, program analysis and verification. So this is a fairly new field for me. Uh, so in the past, I've been mostly doing model building and doing proofs. Uh, so using tool to analyze things is, is new to me. So I have my cl collaborators who are experts in program analysis to help me out. Uh, so here, there are actually lots of interesting problems uh, that we're, we can solve. So for example, now Node.js is becoming really popular. A lot of big companies are trying to move toward Node.js, saying that we don't want to program in Java anymore. Instead, I want to program in JavaScript. Uh, that's a really easy language for the programmer to use. But the problem here is that in Node.js community, uh, you use a NPM packet manager to essentially import a bunch of packets from uh, other people, and then you can write your program by importing other people's package. So there could be a huge dependency tree, uh, depending on which, package you, you, uh, which packages you depend on, and all these packages that you depend on are, are, are contributed by other people that you don't even know. Right, so here, there's a huge security problem in this paradigm. Uh, so we're trying to figure out uh, what's the best way for us to design some sort of analysis tool to, tell, to help program our understanding what's the problem there, uh, warn them that there could be uh, risk if you import these type of packages and so on. So yeah, so other so I, I've, I've, I'm working on program verification with uh, Professor Via Sakara CMU. Uh, so here, what's interesting is that often you can model network as a distributed program, uh, but network has its own patterns and uh, idioms. It could be that by leveraging this, we can make verification more more efficient. Um, so with um, uh, I also clever with. Um, people on the CI side, where we actually look at uh, accountability and blame. So if something goes wrong, uh, how can I figure out who the right person to actually uh, assign blame on? So this is essentially the, the space, but uh, in this talk, I'm just going to talk about two topics in the information flow space. All right, so, uh, so in terms of information flow, what's interesting is that uh, when I go back to this, to this particular diagram, um, on the theory side, actually every year, if you go to any of the uh, uh, somewhat theoretical security paper, you will see a lot of paper being published about new models and definitions about non-interference, which is a key security property about information flow control systems. Uh, this paper appear, uh, numerous paper appear every year. But in reality, uh, the information flow has not been uh, used as a real or practical um, security mechanism in any real systems. Right, so when Android and Chrome uh, got pushed out, that was actually fairly recent. The only thing they can think of is still using permission system, uh, using access control system. They really didn't think about uh, having information flow as part of their security enforcement system. Um, so so my, what I'm interested in is really uh, somewhere uh, uh, towards here where I can use these uh, strong enforcement mechanism uh, information flow to actually eventually uh, put it onto real system to actually uh, help the user to protect their private data. Um, so but first I want to actually motivate information flow. Uh, so here I have a few images on the left. Um, it's on the left, right? So on the left they're mostly older systems where you have the server uh, client uh, paradigm, you have your own PC. Uh, in, 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 those, in those days, uh, the security goal are in general, you want to, for example, guard your file system against unauthorized users. You maybe you want to protect kernels from application process and so on. And the standard mechanism we develop is separation access control, right? So these, two, these mechanisms are still uh, relevant today, um, very much relevant today. We still use separation and access control to protect our resource and our systems. However, on the right-hand side, these are newer 
platforms, right? So nowadays we actually use browsers and use phones to access a lot of services. Right? I, I, I do my banking mostly through my app. Um, when I make an appointment with my doctor, I actually go to the web um, to actually make my appointment. So that means that in this system, um, now there are new goals. There are actually lots of pri users' private information flowing through this platform, right? As I'm, my, as I'm typing my credit card into the browser, actually browser uh, would hold this credit card number in the system. This number is flowing around uh, in, this, uh, in this system and then eventually it goes out, right? Uh, so here we have additional goal to actually protect these kind of user sensitive data that's been put into the system, right? Uh, so here we also, in a, in, a, in a time where it's very easy to install third party uh, applications onto your computer, right? You just go to the App Store, you say, I want to install this, I want to install that. Uh, it's, really, uh, it's really easy to install uh, potentially malicious applications. Uh, so here, in addition, we also want to protect applications from each other. Right? So it's very easy to have mutually distrusting, uh, distrusted applications installed on the same platform. So now, uh, in these systems, uh, for example, in Android, uh, they're still using permission-based systems. Uh, however, I want to argue that the permission-based system is not enough to protect, uh, to prevent the information leakage or privilege escalation. So here's a standard example that you, that you will get when people ask you why permissions are not good enough. So in this example, I have a shopping cart, a shopping um, a, a application, uh, and then we ha I have a camera uh, uh, API. So in Android, if I don't want shopping application to use the camera, uh, I will not give shopping uh, app the permission to access camera. Mm -hmm. So if the shopping cart tries to directly call the camera API, this will be stopped by Android runtime because the permission check failed. However, uh, I can. I could also install a another application, which might be a barcode scanner. Now, because this barcode scanner needs to use the camera to scan barcode, so the barcode scanner uh, is allowed to or given permission to access the camera API. Now, in addition, this barcode scanner export a public API that essentially can be operated by anybody uh, to eventually use a camera uh, going through this public API. So what happens here is that your shopping app, uh, when trying to directly access camera API, will be denied. But when they try to call the public API exposed by barcode scanner, then access camera this way, this will actually be allowed by the access control, right? So the access control is a very immediate check between the caller and the callee. But here, the property we're looking at is actually a more transitive property. We're looking at the entire trace of the execution, right? If I have information flow control, I will be able to stop this. But just using the permissions that's uh, on the phones, I actually can't do this. This is one example here. Um, so the browser have similar uh, a similar problem. So in browser, browser do have SOP, same margin policy, do have CSP, content security policy. And for browser extensions, um, Chrome, I think Firefox also, they have this permission system where the extension would ask for permission from the user uh, based on what permissions granted, uh, the extension can do certain things and barred from doing other things. Uh, the problem there is that uh, uh, even given all these mechanisms, uh, we still don't have fine-grained control over uh, data sharing uh, within the same page. Uh, so for example, here there are some actually real um, real-world malicious uh, Chrome extensions that are trying to steal or hijack a uh, uh, user's Facebook account. We also have news about a malicious extension trying to st uh, hijack the cryptocurrency wallet. So these are not hard to do because the moment uh, you allow the extension to inject script into the page, the, the script essentially have all the access uh, to whatever this, uh, the, the, uh, the URL of the top page, um, that whatever resource the, uh, the, the URL uh, of the top page has, now the in injected, injected script can access the same data. All right, so here is a, uh, so that's uh, what happened uh, in the news. So here is a simple um, example, essentially model what, what, uh, what's happening in those scenarios. Uh, so I'm going to use the password manager as an example. This is just example, but uh, it's similar to the scenario I showed you in the newspaper clip. So what's going on here is that I have a simple page. Let's say it's a CM page. On the CM page, there's a form where uh, there's a user and password field, and the user can put in the username, password, and login. Now, what the user does is the user actually installs a password manager. The password manager essentially, the first time sees the password, is store the username, password in local storage. And the next time when the user goes to the same page, the password manager would uh, load the password and fill it for, for the user. So at the same time, the user install another extension that's actually malicious, what is called the evil. Uh, so it's actually a translation extension that happened to be doing extra stuff on the side. Uh, so what could happen is that uh, when, the, uh, uh, the, when the user goes to cn.com, uh, the password extension will read the password from local storage, send it over to the content script, then the content script would actually fill the password on user's behalf. 
uh, at this time, uh, the evil extension can also inject script into the page. And this evil script, this yellow color CS, would actually be able to read uh, the ID and the password from the DOM and then send it over uh, to the evil extension. So that's how user sensitive password gets leaked to the evil extension. So this scenario is exactly how the evil extension can uh, hijack Facebook account and also how the evil extension can steal the cryptocurrency wallet. Right? So once the content script on the same page, uh, this content script actually has full access over whatever is on this on this page. Right? Uh, so this is allowed in the browser. Right, right now, uh, nothing prevents this from uh, from from happening. So, so what I'm arguing is that uh, given these scenarios, given the additional goals of protecting user private data, uh, we actually need new mechanisms. In addition to, to separation and access control, we also want the information flow control. Right? All these examples actually involve more than one step of information being passed around, and we want to follow this trace of information and eventually stop the bad flow uh, from harming the user. All right. So that's the motivation part. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, one particular, uh, one specific work that we did on, on Chromium, which is the open source version of Chrome. Um, so, so here, what we want to do is we want to prevent information leakage in the browser, like the one I showed you in the example. But at the same time, uh, I also want allowed. Uh, I want to also allow a, a, a desired information sharing, right? So right now, if I embed a, if I embed a script from ad.com, uh, now this script would actually have full access or would be running considering from the same origin as the main page, right? So here, the main main page is CNN. Uh, if even if I load the script from ad, that script would be considered as if it's from CNN as well. Um, so, so in addition, um, I also want to be able to uh, construct a reasonable model and I want to prove security properties about the enforcement mechanism that we're going to develop on this browser. Um, so here, our contribution uh, is that uh, the, the first one is, is a practical contribution. We actually uh, designed and implemented a coarse-grained uh, dynamic taint tracking on Chromium. I'll show you how this works in a, in a, in a sec. Uh, so, so essentially, uh, in, the, in our infrastructure, we actually cover almost all the parts of the browser entity and being able to allow existing behaviors uh, of, the, uh, uh, of this browser. Um, so uh, so the, the second part is that uh, we actually allow a rich policy specification uh, to allow the, uh, the web developer to say how the information should be shared and so on. Um, so then the second part is, is a formal contribution where we say, okay, uh, tainting tend to be an easy way to implement information flow control. Tainting tend to be uh, 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 easily re uh, retrofitted into an existing, existing system. And now the question is, what kind of security property can I get by using tainting, right? Do I actually get really secure system or the system is not as secure as I expected? Uh, so what we did is to formalize the formal properties of tainting and then prove that our design uh, have this property. Uh, this property for all the inf information flow property is always called some sort of non-interference property. All right, so so we're not the first one to do this. Uh, there are actually uh, uh, quite a bit of related work. Uh, people have uh, trying have tried to enforce information flow security using static approaches for a while. So uh, there are information flow type systems. So essentially, instead of just having int and bool, I have uh, int secret, a uh, secret int, or a public int. Uh, by labeling uh, variables and expressions using these kind of types, a type system, uh, meaning the compiler can actually check whether your program uh, can protect the secret int or not. Right? So these are all static approaches. There are also static analysis approach using uh, self-composition to actually do this. Now. In our setting, this is going to be extremely hard because on the web page, I actually don't have all the JavaScript uh, ready to be analyzed because I'm going to embed some script from the ad and at runtime, uh, the ad.com will ship me some script to run in my context. Right? So for me to do site analysis is going to be extremely hard. Um, now, there are also other taint tracking, mostly on JavaScript. So there's JS flow, there's, uh, there's work on uh, implementing a WebKit uh, through the DOM and so on. Uh, so here, uh, they're actually tinting at a variable level. They say, oh, this variable uh, URL uh, is, is a secret, uh, or this password field is a secret, and they follow, uh, they follow the, the variable through the JavaScript engine and then try to figure out whether, at the end of the day, there's a secret being leaked or not. Uh, so here, uh, they are much fine-grained, um, uh, and uh, normally only cover the JavaScript engine part of the browser, so it doesn't go, uh, go beyond, um, say, cookies or history or other parts of the uh, of, uh, of the browser. 
so in terms of inf browser itself, uh, Flowfox is a, a pretty well-known work. Uh, so there, they're not using tainting. So instead, they uh, essentially uh, have a new JavaScript engine uh, use something called secure multi-execution. The idea is that uh, if I know uh, there's some secret uh, input to my system, I know there's some, uh, some public observer output out of my system. What I'll do is I'll run two copies of the program. And the fir in the first copy, uh, I, would not, I would allow the first copy to receive secret, but not allow them to output uh, to public channel. And then in the second copy, I will run as if it's the attacker. I will not give it any real secret input. I will give it default value. And uh, I do allow it to output to the public channel. And at, at the end of the day, I'm going to splice the input and output together uh, across these two executions. Uh, so this is an approach that is going to get nine difference for free uh, because the mechanism itself manually separates the secret input from the public output. However, uh, because it's secure multi-execution, that meant that for each script, you have to execute multiple times. Or it's not a super efficient way of doing this. Again, this is just focused on the JavaScript part of the browser. Uh, so the, the concurrent work with us is this uh, system called Cal is a confinement system. Uh, so it's actually the idea is fairly, sim fairly similar to ours. Uh, they're going to look at each entity uh, in the browser and then they assign an information flow policy associated with each entity and then the runtime will try to enforce uh, some sort of information flow uh, property based on the, based on the policies. Uh, so here uh, it's, it's more of a systems work. Um, uh, they just demonstrate that this, this works, uh, but there are no modeling or proof that the system will give you some sort of nine difference here or not. All right, that's related to work. Um, so now I can actually talk about uh, what we're doing. Uh, so here is essentially uh, a, an approximation of what's in a browser. Uh, so on the left, I have uh, something we call dynamic entities, meaning the things exist when you are browsing. Once you close the browser, it will go away. So for example, uh, you have a lot of tabs, and in each tab you have your DOM tree. Uh, you might uh, inside. Uh, uh, in addition to our main DOM, you actually might have a DOM for iframe pages. You might have page events, for example, things like on click or on, on, on focus and so on. Uh, and then you have a bunch of scripts, right? These scripts could be coming from uh, the same origin, could be third party script, could be content script injected by the extension. Um, and yeah, uh, for extension, you actually have um, uh, each extension have one single core uh, that will be running. Um, well, when you start, when you, when you start the extension, uh, so on the right hand side we have something called static entities. So these are things that would stay when you close the browser. Uh, so for example, cookies, history, bookmark. Uh, we also list browser API here. So essentially, it's something that a user. It's a state that will be kept by the browser. When you close the browser, uh, it will stay. When you open up browser again, uh, you will see uh, you will see the the, the previous saved state um, from the browser. Uh, so what we do is that instead of at the variable level, we're going to take each entity and assign it a information flow label. I'll show you what label, the concrete label in a bit. So this is label essentially represents policy talking about what type of secret this entity is allowed to learn, uh, what, uh, yeah, this, what type of API this, this entity is allowed to access. Um, and each of the communication between entities are monitored, are mediated. Uh, so the reference monitor essentially would check um, when uh, two entities are trying to communicate each other. So for example, uh, for example here, um, so when, say the extension core to try to inject or try to send some data to the content script on the page, uh, so when this send happens, there would actually be a reference monitor check that the sender's label is compatible with the receiver's label. So similarly, when a script tries to access a DOM, uh, the ref monitor will check that this access is allowed. Right? Um, and, and, the, and of course, when the extension core trying to access browser API, such as clear all the cookies or change all the cookies, um, this will actually also be checked by a ref monitor. Right? So th that's roughly how, how this works. Uh, and here, for us, we actually allow labels to change at runtime with tainting. So we could have a, an entity initially doesn't contain any secret, after, upon receiving secret, uh, we will change the label to mark that now this entity actually contains secret. Right? Um, all right, so, so now what I'll do is uh, I would actually go through an example step by step. I'm just going to use the password extension uh, example uh, to show you how do, we, how do we do labeling and how the check is going to happen. Uh, so here, um, uh, the first thing I'll do is I would have to, uh, because I'm going to assign label to each entity. So here I have a CN small cap page and I have a little form with uh, ID and password and login button here. Uh, the first thing I'll do is I would actually have to assign a label to this entity. Uh, so our label is composed of three parts. So the first part is what we call a secrecy label. 
Uh, so essentially, it's essentially saying what kind of type of secret uh, this piece of code uh, has already um, received, and what type of secret uh, this uh, this component is allowed to additionally receive. Um, so, so I have two parts in this secrecy label. So on the left, uh, we call it. Uh, the, the current uh, secrecy level. So here, CN, uh, so we're essentially using the domain as the, uh, as the tags for secrecy. We're going to say that here is secret from this domain, from that domain, so on. Uh, so here, uh, the, on the left part is essentially saying that currently, because this page is loaded from CN, so it's already containing secret from CN. That's the that's left part. The right part is what we call ceiling, meaning that because we allow label to change uh, when more secret arrive, so I want to put a cap on the most, the maximum amount of secret a entity is, real, is allowed to receive. So in the ceiling, this so we have a we have some label called compound label. We use a dot note, use a dot notation. This is saying. Um, this secret belongs to CNN, but in addition, a different entity actually might modify uh, modify the secret. Uh, so here, this is saying that um, the ceiling tells me that in addition to secret from CNN, I can also receive any secret uh, that CNN dot anything. Uh, so essentially, any secret that belongs to CNN, but something else might, some other extension might modify the secret. Um, so that's that. So that's secret label. We have uh, the current level, and we have the max level. Um, if in future times, when this entity receives more secret, it cannot uh, shoot over the ceiling. It has to be capped by the ceiling. All right. So, so we also have the second component is the integrity label. So in, in this example, I'm not going to use the integrity label at all. Uh, you can think of them as a glorified uh, API permission. So if if this uh, actually it doesn't well. Uh, doesn't quite apply on the page for now, but if, if I'm talking about extension, you can imagine here I'm talking about what type of browser APIs that the extension is allowed to access. Um, so the last one is what we call endorsement or declassification label. Um, so essentially this is saying that, well, currently I know CNN, um, but I can actually turn around and declare that I actually don't have any secret at all. So that's a way, that's action of declassification. And I'll show you how, how this works just in a, in a, in a, in a little bit. So that's the label for the for the DOM. Uh, so essentially, when the page gets loaded uh, based on CSP, based on where this DOM is loaded, this policy is semi -auto automatically generated. Uh, so in terms of uh, password extension, um, we also we're going to have policy for the core uh, and also policy for the content script. These are two different components. So for the core policy, again for the secrecy, we have uh, the current level. Uh, so we have two labels. Uh, we have two tags in this label. So this is saying that. This uh, password extension have already seen the password from CNN and also have seen the password from eBay, right? So if you had gone to CNN, put in the password, the, the extension stored it, and then you have gone to eBay, the password extension have stored that password. So the current label is saying that um, the password manager has seen these two passwords. Therefore, the password manager know a uh, secret about these two different domains. Now the ceiling is saying that because this is a password manager, so it's allowed to learn secret from any domain. So I'm going to have star dot, dot, uh, dot, dot, dot password to signify that the ceiling would allow this to happen. All right. So for integrity label, I keep it empty. Now I have a meaningful declassification label. This is saying that I can remove my label. I can remove anything dot, uh, dot password. This means that if uh, currently I know CN password, eBay's password, I can uh, change my label to show that uh, the secret I'm generating is just eBay's password. So I'll show you where we use this just in a little bit. Um, so now for the content script, it has a different label. Uh, so for secrecy, what's interesting is the ceiling. We have a dagger. So what's happening is that uh, when I have a ex browser extension, there will be only one core running, but each time you open a new tab, the content script will be injected into that tab to run as in the context of that particular page. So this dagger is saying, uh, I can receive secret, but I'll be instantiated once when I inject into the page, right? So right now it's dagger, but the moment I inject the content script into CNN, this dagger will turn into CNN. Because on that page, this particular script uh, can at most learn CNN's password secret. Right, so, th so that's the interesting part. So for, for evil extension, we have very similar um, uh, label. So here, the the evil extension come the core come with no secret, but it's allowed to uh, learn anything that 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 the, the evil extension have touched. Uh, for content script, we have very similar. Um, this eve should be actually evil. Um, the the yeah the the ceiling of the secrecy is is very similar to uh, the password content script. All right, so now we can actually run this example to see. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah, that's
have a question about the settings on the evil, evil extension. So is that possible that the evil extension tries to claim that the, um, it also holds that CNN the password the label? Is that possible? It's or possible, yeah. Then, um, so it seems like there is, should be some sort of the, the what is that, um, sort of the check phase that the um, evil extension shouldn't claim such um, DD policy. So uh, what will be dangerous, it would be evil extension have it in the ceiling. That means that evil extension allowed to learn mm -hmm. this. Uh, so yes, so this is similar to um, when you install yeah. browser extension. Uh, the browser extension will say, this extension asks for all these permissions, yes. do you allow or not? So that's a check mm -hmm. would happen. W we don't have a automatic check right now. Yeah, so it seems yeah. like I mean, if, um, in the, um, the, the current setting in the Chromium browsers, uh, when we are actually installing the browser, uh, installing the extension, and um, users sort of the uh, we are sort of the pushing the responsibility to check the per policy by the users. Yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. it, it, it seems like your system also has the, the same issues. Yes, yes. So any, anything that have a policy, the question is always where, where the policy come from, who is checking the policy, is reasonable or not, right? Uh, so th there, uh, and also there's studies showing that the user never care about yep. when yep. they're being asked, right? Uh, so now, now the question, I think there, are, there is some work, uh, I would say related work, where they try to check whether extensions or uh, Android apps are over permissioned. Uh, I felt like that's a more, more uh, promising way to go. So when the extension asks for, asks for a certain label, um, I guess we have to check whether they need it or not. Um, that requires a pro programmatic um, static check of the code itself, right? So if, if you don't want to re rely on the user, then we have to be able to automatically check some things. Yeah, so, the, yeah, so I think in terms of information flow, usability is actually a, a, a fairly important issue, right? So here I write my policy this way. Uh, it, it may not be the most, it may not be the best way to actually write the policy, right? People actually uh, would have confusion about what the policy is about, yeah. Other questions? All right, so, all right, so we're doing the, uh, the, the injection. Um, so here, uh, what I will do is I will try to inject the content script into the page. Um, so there are a few checks needs to happen. Uh, so when I inject the content script uh, here, uh, because the content script itself doesn't contain any secret, uh, so that injection uh, will, will succeed. What's happening is I just need to instantiate the dagger with the uh, parent page uh, 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 domain or, the, or the, the origin. So here, instead of dagger, now it becomes cn.password because now this content script is running in the context of the, uh, of the CN's page. Uh, so now what I want to do is I want to show you the step where the uh, core of the content ma uh, the password manager will uh, read the password from local storage and try to send the password to the content script uh, to be injected. So here actually we need to do a label check well, because what's happening is information is being sent from the core to the content script, right? So what they're checking is to see whether the secret uh, that the password manager knows uh, is a subset of the ceiling of the uh, content script, right? So this is saying that the secret that the sender is uh, that the sender knows is it a subset of what the receiver is allowed to receive, right? So unfortunately, this one actually this check will not succeed. The reason is that the password manager has already seen uh, two sites password, uh, so I have no way of knowing whether the password manager. Uh, it's sending me the right CN password or not, right? It could be that the password manager actually read eBay's password and try to put it into CN's page, right? In that case, it's actually insecure. Uh, however, here, because we trust the password manager, so we actually gave the password manager a declassification uh, token here, right? We're saying uh, we trust the password manager to actually remove any secrecy label that's in the form of something dot password. Uh, so here, the password manager could actually declassify and remove eBay password, essentially change itself, change the label from cn.password, eBay.password to just cn.password. Right? This is a very dangerous operation because um, uh, by using the same um, operation, this password manager can erase all secret and start sending this to the public channel. Right? Uh, but this, this is considered a trust operation. So after this de declassification, uh, the label of the uh, core of the password pass manager turn into send out password. Uh, now this is actually uh, match the ceiling uh, of the content script. So at this point, uh, this sending is allowed. Right now, um, now this uh, password can be filled uh, into 
uh, uh, can be received by the content script, right? Um, so, so, so in addition, when we send the data over, initially the content script contain no secret. Uh, once this password being sent to the content script, we actually have to taint um, the label of the content script to remember that now the content script actually contains send our password secret, right? So this is a way of doing the tainting step uh, when the data is, is received by the content script, right? Uh, so so this, the next step would be the content script would try to inject the password into the page. So uh, what we need to do, this is again another information flow here. We need to check that the information being sent to the, uh, to the uh, form um, is allowed to receive this password. Right? So now what we're checking again is checking the current secret label, the relation between the current secret label and the, the, the ceiling of the recipient label. Right? Here, because it's a wildcard, <coughs> so this check would, would actually succeed. Um, now this password can actually be filled uh, into this page. Um, and then uh, again, we're going to do the tainting uh, because initially this page is loaded from CN, only have CN password, uh, only have CN secret. Now I'm actually putting user's password in here. So now I'm going to change the label to be CN password to uh, essentially taint this label to represent additional secret. All right. All right, so, so that's essentially the step of, of putting the password in. Uh, how do we do declassification? How do we do tainting? All right, so now we'll show you if we have the right policy, how do we actually stop the attack, right? The attack is the content script uh, is, is on the page and trying to read this password, right? So now the information goes from uh, the, the ID and password to the, to the uh, uh, content, uh, content script of the evil extension. Uh, so we're going to do the same check. We're trying to see whether uh, the current level of this ID password field, which is in the password, is a subset of the ceiling of the uh, content script, right? Now here, this check would actually fail because the extension is not allowed to learn uh, cn.password. Uh, therefore, the reference monitor will actually stop this send from happening, right? So that's where, that's where, that's how we allow the content script uh, of this evil extension to operate on other parts of the DOM, but not allow to operate on the password part of the DOM, right? This is a fine-grained sharing and information flow control uh, in the context of the, of the web page. All right, any question here? Yeah, so here for all the information flow stuff, the big thing is uh, you have to be super careful with the policy and also with declassification. The moment you have declassification token, it's, it's things gonna, it's gonna be dangerous, yeah. Um, I have a question about the, how do you uh, update the label? So for example, let's say you have uh, two extensions and um, let's say one guy did load the field and then the other guy updated the field again and then how you actually come up with the new label which accommodating those two extensions. So if, if I if I allow to do that, um, I just do a union. Uh, with oh, the so you just put that every information. Yeah, in yeah. So I check the ceiling. Uh, have I hit the ceiling uh, yet? If I haven't exceed the ceiling, then I take the union of the label. That will be the tainting operation. Yeah. But the, um, from the system's perspective, I mean, if you have too many labels, then that's going to be pretty hard to propagate, right? And yes, uh, yes. So, so uh -huh. yeah. So in terms of in terms of usability, yes. So depending on how much communication there is, uh, you you might be accumulating a lot of labels. But from from what we are looking at the, well, I guess we didn't really interact with the page, but we crawled over a bunch of pages. We rarely so for the regular pages, we rarely see the communication depth more than four. So the page loads itself, uh, maybe loads some CDN, when to add. If you're going to Google Analytics or double click, they will additionally load a few other ads, and then maybe one more. That's the a, that's a complexity we see in ordinary pages. If you go through this path, and you don't have really crazy read and write into the DOM, um, you tend to stay at a smaller label. But another thing we were thinking about is to, to cluster labels. Uh, so say that it, 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 uh, your main domain, CDN, uh, trackers, advertisers, uh, and then maybe uh, if the user declare, I trust Google, Amazon ad system, uh, they would be bucketed into one, versus the untrusted ads and tracker, they'll be bucketed into another one. Instead of tracking all the uh, domains, I'm gonna track the bucket, uh, which bucket are you in, then we'll be reduced to three or four labels max. That's one way we're, we're exploring right now. Uh, but it's unclear in reality work or not. Uh, unless we, we look at the real pages, it's, we don't have the data right now. But it seems like for all the data, for all the uh, okay web page we look at, they rarely go down to more than four, four different levels when they go down, uh, trying to talk to each other. Yeah. 
All right, so where am I? So in terms of implementation, um, we have to go into Chromium to actually modify things. We didn't touch the uh, JavaScript engine because uh, our entity is not a variable level. Instead, we're, uh, our entity is the entire script level. Uh, so the main thing we modify is actually the IPC call. So it's essentially inside the browser. Roughly, you have a browser process, which is the glue of all your tabs. So in this uh, in this browser process, this so this process is going to handle all the storages, handle the user uh, the the UI, the user's input, and also um, handle the on the network request. And then for each of the tabs, for each of the tab of the <coughs> scripts and the rendering engine uh, you run, each one of them actually have a separate process. Um, and uh, when the user is typing stuff, this, this glue code would be, in, would be in charge of sending IPC uh, to the rendering engine to say, oh, hey, uh, there's some change to input to the DOM. When something happens here, the user needs to know the IPC call will come back uh, to actually uh, 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 essentially go into the network to grab more resources or go into the storage to store or read and write stuff. Um, so these IPC calls essentially are the uh, uh, key parts we actually have to instrument our code. Uh, here we have to actually, for each entity, when, they, when data are being sent back and forth uh, between them, the IPC have to ferry the label across them and do label check. Right? So that's roughly where the modification happens. Uh, but in terms of modifying Chromium, it's actually fairly complex. Um, we have to have a professional programmer to actually go and do it. Uh, none of our PhD students can handle the complexity of the, of the stack trace. Uh, but, but now we actually have an infrastructure that can actually do proper tainting uh, using the Chromium. All right, so, so in terms of formal proof of security, what we need to do is there's no hope to prove anything on implementation because it's so messy. Uh, so instead, we want to say, uh, categorically speaking, the kind of model, uh, the kind of design we're working on uh, is, is this sound, right? So what we do is we actually model the main part of the, uh, the browser functionality and then model uh, the, uh, the, taint, the taint tracking part. And then we have to define the property that we think we can prove. Uh, because when you say non-interference, there are actually very, uh, a lot of different definitions of non-interference based on your system. Um, so, so here we define our version of non-interference. So essentially all non-interference trying to say the attacker cannot learn any secret by observing public output or by altering the public input. Uh, well, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, so something like this. Uh, yeah, I think I, do. I have a more detailed slide uh, after this. Uh, and then when you do the modeling, when you define the property, then you have to prove that the model actually have this property, right? Um, so, so a little bit detail about the nine interference. Uh, so. Often what you, what you need to do is you need to define what's the secret in your system, what's the, the attacker's observation, right? So here we have the standard web attacker scenario where the, the attacker can own, a web, uh, can own a web server, can inject script uh, into the page, they, can, they might actually control some of the extensions and so on. Uh, so what they can observe is the ex execution trace, right? That include all, so if the extension, if the malicious uh, attacker have an event handler, then the attacker will be able to observe all the events sent to the event handler. Uh, if the attacker is making a call to the network and having a uh, request coming back, then that will be the observation, part of the observation of the attacker also. So in terms of non-interference, we actually define something called a trace equivalence based non-interference. So what we want to say in terms of non-interference is saying that if I run the system, if I start with two configurations that uh, that they are the same in terms of the attacker components, but they might be different in the secret or something called, sometimes we call it high component. Um, if, I, if I start my execution in these two configurations, for any trace that is observable by the attacker uh, starting from the first configuration, I should be able to find the equivalent trace starting from the second configuration uh, where the attacker can actually observe the exact same behavior and vice versa. So what this is saying is that when the attacker see a trace, it cannot deduce which configuration it's in. Therefore, it cannot uh, know too much about the secret. Right? So that's roughly what, 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 what we prove. Uh, however, the problem here is that uh, we're not um, uh, considering declassification. In this particular definition, we're not saying uh, with declassification, what can we say? Uh, we're actually saying uh, without declassification, here is what you get. Right? When we have declassification, we don't have a good theorem uh, talking about declassification right now. So that, that's why uh, in the future work, we're actually thinking about using knowledge-based non-interference to actually talk, talk about uh, in declassification um, what kind of knowledge the attacker would be able to infer based on the declassification. Right? Um, so, so to summarize, so what's going on here, I said that I, I want to be somewhere here. So Chromium is obviously a working system, uh, have lots of features. Uh, so I'm, I'm up here 
Um, so there, so what we're doing is we actually instrument a um, a real browser where we can actually do coarse grain uh, team tracking. And uh, at the end of the day, what we prove is that on the model level, we're proving uh, the enforcement have trace based nine difference, right? Uh, so there are gap. There are gaps between uh, a fully verified system um, and what we have. I mean, one obvious gap is that uh, whatever proof we're doing is on design, not on the implementation, right? As I said, there's no hope I can do this on the implementation at all. Uh, the other gap was interesting is that uh, this taint method is fairly easy to understand to implement, but in reality, uh, it's actually causing additional flows, and there are features of the browser that it's extremely hard for us to handle to plug the leaks. So, for example, uh, in the browser, the DOMs are synchronous, right? If I read the element, I get a pointer or I get a value uh, back right away. Now, the question is. Uh, if I'm trying to read uh, a, a DOM element that's been tainted, that contains secret, what should I do, right? Um, so if I return a default value, uh, the attacker would actually know that my uh, that this, this node has been tainted, uh, therefore there's one, one bit of information leakage. Uh, if I don't, if I don't, re well, if I return default value, you will know. If I return an error code, the attacker sees the difference. I cannot return the real value because that's a secret, right? So it's fairly hard to deal with. So instead we, um, what we do is we just have the script get stuck, meaning it never returns. Um, that allows us to prove our weak non interference, but in reality, this is still a leak uh, in a sense that that's actually related to the scheduler because the attacker knows that the, the JavaScript in general have a single thread, single threaded loop. Uh, so if my scripts are running, suddenly uh, I see the first 10 instructions being executed, but the 11th instruction didn't come. I know that my script gets stuck, right? Again, this is one bit leak of, of information. Uh, so this synchronous feature is really hard to handle. It would be nice if everything is asynchronous, um, then I can use scheduler to actually hide some of the, uh, some, some the information leakage. Um, yeah. So when you think it gets so you, you, when you say it's a leakage of information, can you give an example of what, is, what kind of leakage is this? Like, Let's say that... Um, is it like my password was wrong? Is that how you know that I didn't put the correct password? Or what kind of leakage are we? So, so let's say that you, ha you hold a secret 0 or 1, mm -hmm. right? Um, you cannot directly talk to me because your label is high, my label is low. Uh, so instead, you uh, is, is, is a variable. Uh, initially, you are low, so I keep reading you. you. Your value has been 10 from the beginning. Then what you do to tell me zero or one is to uh, write to him or not. So if you write to him, now he becomes high because you tainted him. I've been reading 10 all the time. Suddenly, I, I don't either get an error code or get default value or I didn't get any, any value back. I know something's up because I know you told me if your value is one, you're going to taint him. I know oh, your value is one. However, if I keep reading it, uh, you know, we, we probably have, should have agreement in terms of timing. Mm -hmm. If I keep reading it, I figured uh, if you uh, could have tainted him, you, you, you would have done it already. Now I know your secret is zero. So I can do this guess because of this synchronous uh, uh, operation plus the tainting the ref monitor is doing. <coughs> so, so, so it's an implicit flow that we're allowing uh, in our system unless we actually have the script get stuck, meaning um, when I ask, uh, I, I got terminated. I got nothing left. Um, that's only a... a, a uh, but that also gives information. That's also giving information. Yeah, That's what exactly. I'm saying, right? That's yeah. also giving information. Uh, Unless you are always going to get terminated randomly, then yes. Probably. Then if you, if I have a randomized scheduler, then I'm hiding this behavior because I'm just saying, oh, the scheduler went away, did something else, instead of me getting stuck because I'm reading the tainted value. So it's very hard. I don't know. So it's okay. so the tainting. It's very weak. That's all that we're, we're saying. It's an easy way to implement this kind of imp implicit leaks. It's really hard to to actually plug these holes, yeah. We'll probably have to go secure multi-execution um, that, that route. Anyhow, so, uh, yeah, the other part about scheduler, so we're gonna talk about scheduler, right? If, if I just get you stuck, uh, if I know the scheduler is deterministic, I know I'm getting stuck. Otherwise, if I have a non-deterministic non -deterministic scheduler, uh, I could be thinking that scheduler might have gone away to do something else. So in our model, we actually, uh, uh, assume uh, we actually in the model assumes a non-deterministic scheduler. That's why we can prove the non-interference. But in reality, uh, JavaScript engine—I mean, different browsers implement things differently. But in general, they have a main, one main thread for all the UI uh, events. For the worker events, there's a concurrent thing. Then there's a preemptive events and so on. So there's a fair bit of complexity in the scheduler. But the attacker actually have some view about what scheduler 
uh, can do at the back of their mind, right? So these are the gaps between uh, what we do and the real, real sound proof at the end of the day, even at the, even at the design level. Uh, yeah, so this, this is actually the gap where, where I'm trying to think about how, how, what's the best way to actually fix this. I mean, if, if uh, one answer could be that I'm okay with one bit leak, uh, then, then, then I'm done, because I, I, I can only afford tainting. Or you can say I can go more expensive, then I might go up to secure multi execution or do static analysis and so on. All right. So this, yeah. This is somehow a uh, random question. Like <laughs> So we know DDC, um, a lot of the timing channels in the browsers to tell the, the sort of the fingerprint in the browser. And what you're saying is something more aggressive. So this is starting with that, not only fingerprint in the browser, you can somehow run the values if you have this sort of the uh, feature, like a stocking in the middle. Yeah. And, um, and uh, so I kind of feel that the, the, the first thing um, the, 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 the comes to my mind is that the, um, based on your label, maybe perhaps you can uh, identify those timing channels because you sort of know the timing channels in this yeah, case. Yeah, so that's one thing we want to do, right? So what we're saying is that for me to actually leak a lot of data, the attacker need to exhibit certain behavior to leak it. Uh, if I can prove this, then my ref monitor can identify these behavior patterns to get rid of them. I don't have a formal theorem about it. That's that, that's that's what we're looking at as well. So how can we corner the? Can we use this record monitor to corner the attacker into a, a narrow corner so that they exhibit really uh, deterministic patterns? Certain API they have to use. Then I can have another monitor to actually identify these APIs to stop them earlier. So yeah, so that's something that we're, we're kind of interested in as well. It's hard to do, well. Hard to do a theorem about it right now, so I, I, it's in the experimental state right now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. So in terms of the gap between the real system, um, well, I have a gap. Yeah, I have a gap. Right. So, so we have lots of complaints about policy. It's complex, right? It's uh, hard to tell people what's going on. People are going to ignore it. We rely on the user to do stuff, and also declassification is very dangerous as well, right? Uh, so these are all the. Uh, practical issues that I don't ha have the expertise to solve. Uh, we actually have experts in HCI. Um, hopefully, they will help us to solve some of these problems. All right, I think I'm. I think I'm running out of time. Um, for the IoT stuff, it's really what's interesting about this is that when you use if this and that, essentially you can you can you can define rules to connect um, uh, endpoints. So I can write a rule saying that if the weather is about 70, turn my nest to X temperature, right? I can also say if I receive email, uh, store the um, extension to my OneDrive. So, so in, in this framework, you can write a lot of these rules. You can create a lot of information paths uh, through different devices, right? Now, things actually are not that rosy because I can have a rule saying when, I, when, I, when I'm on my road, I can say, oh, take a, whenever I take an iPhone when I'm traveling, uh, upload the picture to Flickr so everyone knows my, you know, fancy tour, uh, touring experience, like for example here. Uh, but say that I forgot to turn this rule off, uh, when I go home, I actually need to take a picture of my passport, and now this picture now shows up on Flickr, right? So you do have secrecy problem thinking about where the information, who can see my information. And then the dual side internal information flow on this uh, f problem with this is, is uh, one of the integrity. So for example, I can write a rule, this is a real rule, if I can say if I'm tagging the photo, uh, I'll do a new status, right? This is useful if you're going to a party, your friends taking a picture, your friends tag you, then you have this nice uh, state about you, you know, limits at uh, XYZ's party and uh, taking a picture with what. Uh, but there are also unintended effects if you're in some interesting gathering you may not want people to know. Uh, so here you don't control the status update, instead it's other people controlling it, right? So that's the integrity issue. Uh, so here what we're doing is it's fairly practical work, we actually sift through all the public if this and that um, recipes, try to systematically analyze what's the problem, what's the secrecy and the integrity problem, right? Um, so, so essentially, uh, we view this as information flow, flow problem, figure out what are the secrecy uh, labels we can assign to all these recipes, and same with integrity, and find problems there. Um, so in terms of analysis result, I'm going to just jump over this. Uh, so we look at all the recipes, about 20,000 unique recipes. Actually, half of them have uh, some problem. Uh, so uh, let's say 
I guess over the half, 33 of them actually have integrity problem, and uh, another uh, 27 of them actually have secrecy problem, and 10% have both of the problem, right? Uh, so this is like, uh, if, if the designer have thought about information flow, they could have done some warning to the user, but people only thought about functionality, didn't really think about uh, so the where security side. Where you get these side. examples from? Mm -hmm. Where you get these examples from? Uh, there's a public recipe that one of CMU students scrubbed from IFT, where actually one, there's a database, there's a, we can actually share this, it's public shareable anyway. Mm -hmm. So they actually have an like Excel sheet of all the recipe people actually use. Oh, okay, so we actually gone through all of them, yeah. All right, so I'm going to finish my talk with the uh, last slide. Um, so, so, so basically, I'm going back to this, uh, you know, there's difference between theory and practice. Uh, so if you do research on both ends, you talk to both people, both sides of the camp, you realize there's actually a gigantic gap between it. So if, I, if I'm in system research, uh, my uh, mindset often is, here's a really interesting idea, I'm going to implement this, I'm going to measure the performance and publish my paper. If I'm in the theory camp, what I do is, oh, here's a really interesting intellectual problem, I'm going to build a model, define properly, and prove it. Right. Uh, so, however, uh, in reality, if you have software, I actually want to have both. Right. Well, I want to have uh, nice features. I also want to have uh, a, a pretty strong uh, security guarantee. Right. So this is this gap is fairly wide. Uh, there are actually many interesting challenges when you actually look into the combination of of, of these fields. Uh, I've done some work, but actually, I'm nowhere near solving any of the I would say real problem. I'm still trying to make progress to actually solve additional problems here. All right. Any questions? Yeah, let's dance. Thank you. Are there any questions? Maybe I'll start. So, uh, in your first talk, when you mentioned about the, you generally talked about confinement or privacy or secrecy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then there can be issues with the integrity, which it may happen that because <laughs> somebody is able to play with the integrity, yeah, that they can actually infer some information. Yeah, uh, you didn't go into detail, but I assume that you have some already uh, work or thoughts in that direction. So, what I don't have is um, I don't have a nice theorem about the attacker cannot manipulate secrecy based on integrity. Um, I had some of I have I had some of that in the in the previous earlier Android work, but yes. Yeah, so so in this example, secrecy is easy to explain. So we never touch touch upon integrity because the label is always empty. Mm -hmm. But in practice, what we do is we track integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, so so you can imagine there's interesting interaction between the secrecy and integrity. Mm -hmm. If I uh, if maybe a low integrity attacker can cause secrecy to change, therefore yeah. leak information. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I think our theorem actually covered that case, mm -hmm. just because the equivalence, the projection, come out to throughout, um, throughout all the different behavior based on the high label, and then we have to force all the low behavior to be the same. That 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 will be ruled out. Okay. But I don't have a separate theorem about that. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Other questions? Anything else? All right. Then I guess uh, yeah, you can ask question uh, while talking to her now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>